So this lecture is about enzymes. It is divided into two parts. The first part is all about the general concepts, which wherein we shall be discussing the characteristics and the mechanism of action, as well as the structure and enzyme regulation before we proceed with enzyme kinetics. So let's start now with the first part of our lecture, which is general concepts. So first of all, what are enzymes? So enzymes are proteins which accelerate chemical reactions. If they are proteins, they have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and sometimes even up to quaternary level of structures. Some enzymes are made up of RNA, we call them ribozymes. So enzymes are responsible for regulating metabolic reaction rates. So two keywords that you should remember, biological catalysts. So how do enzymes work? So any reactant and any product would have a corresponding free energy for the reaction to proceed. The free energy of the product should be less than the free energy of the reactant for this reaction to be spontaneous. When we say spontaneous, however, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will proceed right away. The rate at which a reaction will proceed depends on the energy of activation. So that is the energy difference between the free energy of the reactant versus the free energy of the transition state shown by the peak of the curve. And this energy difference is what we call the energy of activation. So this is the energy barrier that must be overcome by the reactant for the reaction to proceed. And the higher it is, the more time it would take for the reaction to proceed. In the presence of an enzyme, the formation of ES complex results to a lower energy of activation, and therefore, the reaction proceeds at a much faster rate. So the bottom line, enzymes lower the energy of activation. Now for enzymes to work, they have to bind to the substrate. So the part of the enzyme that binds to the substrate is what is called the active site or the catalytic site, and it should fit the shape of the substrate. So the association between the enzyme and the substrate is only temporarily temporary, which means once the substrate is turned into a product, the product is released right away so that the enzyme can bind to another new substrate. And there are, of course, other sites on the enzyme. We call them the allosteric sites. So this is defined as any site other than the active site. When enzymes bind to the substrate, there are two models that are used to illustrate the process. So the older one is called the lock and key. So in this model, the active site complements the substrates precisely. So no conformational change is necessary. So this explains one important characteristic of an enzyme, and this is what is called specificity. And once the substrate is turned into a product, the product is released right away. However, there is a limitation to this theory, and that implies that the enzyme is a rigid molecule, which is not always the case. It also implies that enzymes can only act on one substrate, which is not always the case. So this has been modified, and the modification is called the induced fit theory. So the active site is not a completely rigid fit for the substrate. However, when the substrate approaches the active site, the active site will undergo a conformational change when exposed to the substrate, allowing now for a fit between the enzymes, active site, and the substrate. So this now explains another important characteristic of an enzyme. This is called broad specificity, which means an enzyme can act on a wide range of substrates as long as the substrates are structurally related to each other. So now let's move on to the structure of an enzyme. Some enzymes are made up purely of proteins, so we refer to them as simple enzymes. However, there are some enzymes that are complex. We call them hollow enzymes. So if we break down the components of a hollow enzyme, a hollow enzyme is made up of a cofactor as well as the apoenzyme. 
So the apoenzyme is the protein portion of the enzyme, whereas the cofactor is the non-protein part, which can be either a prosthetic group or a coenzyme. So the difference between a prosthetic group and a coenzyme is that a prosthetic group is tightly bound to the apoenzyme, whereas the coenzyme is loosely bound to the apoenzyme. So to recap, so enzymes are, are referred to as a holoenzyme when it is uh, the active enzyme and it is complete. All the non-protein components are present. However, an enzyme without its non-protein portion is termed as the apoenzyme and by itself is inactive. The non-protein part of an enzyme is called the cofactor and there are two types of cofactors, coenzymes as well as prosthetic growth. So what is the difference? A coenzyme is loosely bound to the apoenzyme by non-covalent bond. This is exemplified by vitamins or compounds derived from vitamins. And the prosthetic groups, which are tightly bound to the apoenzyme, so they are rather difficult to separate from the apoenzyme itself. Let's move on now to enzyme regulation. So I'll be presenting four, enzymogenic cleavage, allosteric regulation, reversible covalent modification, as well as genetic control. So the first three are involved in short-term regulation of an enzyme and it produces immediate effect. So the last one, the latter, genetic control is for long-term regulation of enzyme activity. So let's go to the first one, irreversible covalent modification or zymogen cleavage. Now this is particularly applicable to proteolytic enzymes. So these enzymes are stored as inactive zymogens or proenzymes. So these enzymes are activated by cleaving the zymogen. This is exemplified by chymotrypsinogen, which is produced in the pancreas. So chymotrypsinogen is composed of about 245 amino acids linked by intramolecular disulfide, disulfide linkages. So in the initial round of activation, so the amino acids between number 15 and number 16 are cleaved off yielding two fragments still linked together by disulfide linkage. We call this the... Um, pi chymotrypsin. This will further undergo activation with the removal of amino acids 14 and 15, as well as number 147 and 148, yielding now three fragments still linked together by disulfide linkages. So this is now referred to as alpha chymotrypsin. So this is the most active form of the enzyme. So as you can see from the illustration, this involves cleavage of the zymogen, yielding now a smaller enzyme that is active in form. It is also reversible because once you cleave off the peptide bond, you can no longer put it back together. So this form of enzyme regulation is um, used to control mostly proteolytic enzymes, exemplified by those enumerated in this tabulation, such as pepsinogen, Trypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase, and proelastase. Now, another form of enzyme regulation is called allosteric regulation. So, in this particular mechanism, an enzyme is um, modified by the binding of a regulator through non covalent binding. So, the allosteric enzyme can transition from active to inactive form and vice versa. So this form of regulation is usually utilized for feedback, inhibition, or activation of an enzyme in a biochemical pathway. So let's take an illustration here. So initially, the substrate binds to the active site. The active site is turned into a product and is released. So let's say there is now an excessive accumulation of products, so we have to inhibit the pathway. So the product can actually bind to the allosteric site. This will cause a conformational change on the enzyme 
making it less receptive to the substrate. So the substrate doesn't bind as much and therefore the substrate is no longer turned into a product. Now of course this process is reversible if the amount of product now goes down the allosteric inhibition is also reversed and once more the enzyme can bind to the substrate and is active once more turning the substrate into a product. So this form of regulation is usually utilized as a the process for um, feedback inhibition of a some pathway. So in this example, there are a series of reactants from A, B, C, D, E, and P. Um, each step is catalyzed by their respective enzymes. So in this example, say there is excessive accumulation of product P, it can allosterically inhibit the initial enzyme E1 again through allosteric regulation. So to recap, in allosteric inhibition, the final product accumulates in abundance. The excess final product binds to the allosteric site. The enzyme is inhibited and it results to less product produced. And the response here is immediate and the process is, irrever is reversible. Something similar to allosteric regulation is covalent modification. So this involves the covalent binding of a modifying group, usually a phosphate. So just like allosteric regulation, the enzyme can transition from active and inactive and vice versa. So compared to allosteric regulation, the effect here is slower and longer lasting, but still immediate. This is best exemplified by um, glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen phosphorylase is an enzyme involved in the um, breakdown of glycogen to glucose. We call it glycogenolysis. So this enzyme, glycogen phosphorylase, can transition from active to inactive form by the attachment and removal of a phosphate group. So in its active form, it is phosphorylated as shown by the green um, object and in its inactive form, it is dephosphorylated as shown by the red object. The attachment of a phosphate is catalyzed by an, another enzyme called kinase, whereas the removal of the phosphate is catalyzed by another enzyme called phosphatase. Now, this process is hormonally regulated. So when blood sugar is low, glucagon goes up, which activates the enzyme kinase, which in turn phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase, rendering glycogen phosphorylase active. On the other hand, when blood sugar is high, insulin goes up, activates phosphatase, removing now the phosphate from glycogen phosphorylase, rendering the enzyme inactive. So to recap, so covalent modification is the reversible covalent modification of enzyme activity, which can be accomplished via phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. Phosphorylation is catalyzed by another protein called kinase, and dephosphorylation is catalyzed by another protein called phosphatase. Now compared to allosteric regulation, this is slower and longer lasting, but still the effect is considered immediate. Now finally, the last means of controlling enzyme activity is at the level of the gene, and this is exemplified by the LAC operon, which encodes for the enzyme lactase. So lactase is present only if the substrate lactose is present. So the LAC operon is turned off without the substrate lactose. So in this illustration, we have the LAXZ gene, which encodes for the enzyme lactase. It is under the control of other DNA sequences, such as the operator, which can be likened to the off switch, and to the promo and another um, DNA sequence called the promoter, which can be likened to the on switch. So let's say we don't have the substrate lactose. Without lactose, a protein called repressor binds to the operator, shutting down the LAC operon. The RNA polymerase can no longer access the promoter region, and there would be no transcription of the LACC gene, and therefore 
the gene is rendered silent. What about in the presence of the substrate lactose? Well, lactose binds to the repressor, causing a conformational change. The repressor loses affinity to the operator. This now allows free access of the RNA polymerase to the promoter region. And the RNA polymerase transcribes the LACZ gene into RNA. And the RNA is eventually translated into the protein lactase. So to recap, without lactose, the repressor binds to operator. The RNA polymerase is unable to bind to the promoter region. The lac operon is not transcribed into mRNA and not translated into lactase. When lactose is present, it binds to the active repressor protein. The repressor is inactivated. The RNA polymerase is now able to bind to the promoter region, and the lac operon is transcribed into mRNA, and the mRNA is eventually translated into lactase. So let's summarize what we have discussed so far. So enzymes are biological catalysts. They function by lowering the energy of activation. Since they are proteins, they can be affected by pH, temperature, and substrate concentration. How do we regulate enzymes? We have presented four, storage, azimogen, allosteric regulation, covalent modification. All three are for immediate um, control of enzyme activity, whereas for long-term control, enzymes can be induced through gene regulation. So we shall be continuing uh, with the next part.